Still working good? Can everybody hear me in the back? All right. Again, the introduction, my name is Justin Durner. I'm with the USDA Agriculture Research Service, which is the in-house research arm of USDA. We have the hard-funded research doing long-term high-risk type research uh, in difference to some of the university, which is a short-term grant-funded research. I'm based in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Our research unit is based in Wyoming and Colorado. And the work we'll show today is some of the stuff we've done in Colorado. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague David Augustine up there, who's a research ecologist. Uh, he's done a lot of work in wildlife, especially in, in grassland birds. And so the work today is from some of our work that we've done. Ken had the slide where we were engineering the landscape for livestock production, where we took the oaks out of the California oak woodlands. We're going to switch course and reverse it and say, how can we use these livestock as the engineer for the system to accomplish these ecosystem goods and services showcased here? Is this going to work, Dustin? There we go. So I'd like to start off and, and get everybody kind of a good frame of mind. It's early in the morning still. But Gary Larson here, I think, did a fantastic job of capturing rangeland management in the 20th century. This is it, folks. Right? We're supposed to be livestock managers. This is some, whatever the entity is that's the bad guy telling us we're doing it wrong because this is not acceptable. Right? Our expectation of mowing lawn is that this ought to be uniform, everything ought to be short, sweet, look good, and the dog did it wrong. Well, what we want to try and accomplish in the next 20 minutes here is to say this might be absolutely perfect given the outcome, given the desired objective that you want to accomplish from these ecosystem services that society wants from rangelands. So Jones, in 1994, came up and coined the term ecosystem engineers. Pretty fancy term. It's nice to use. But it's essentially just something that can modify out their vegetation structure and composition. We got the perfect tool. It has four legs, and it's a rumen that can utilize whatever is produced out there in some sort of way to produce, again, livestock production or other ecosystem goods and services. And on the rangelands, especially most of those in the United States, the major driver historically and still today is livestock grazing. Many areas, as Kim mentioned, we have use of prescribed fire, whether or not it's in terms of frequency, seasonality, and duration. In our systems, we also have this small mammal here, prairie dog, that has a huge influence on driving dynamics of vegetation. And in most of the western United States, drought is again a major driver, which we have little control over, but we have to be adaptive. And with climate change, potentially might be a bigger player in terms of our management strategies in the near-term future. With that, and Ken set this up quite well, in the 20th century, our management was largely for livestock production. We've done great number of studies on many ecosystems on optimizing this daily gain and gain per unit land area. And where the intersection is, that's our moderate stocking rate, sustainable. Right? And so what we want to do is obtain that, and to do that, we want to make sure we have facilitating practices, as Ken mentioned, in terms of fence, water, and we graze uniformly. Things look nice and packaged. 20th century, we did this quite well. If we didn't like what we had out there, we improved the rangeland. In our system, if we had this cactus out there, which is a pain because it doesn't do anything in terms of forage production, utilizes soil water, Let's get rid of it. We invented all kinds of things. Here's a mechanical harvester you run around over the prairie, takes out the prickly pear, puts it in a little hopper, and you take it off site and you get rid of it. If we didn't like the grass, we threw something else out there and planted it. In terms of livestock, we've done a tremendous amount of work on increasing gain, making it more efficient, changing the genetics, adapting, making this system much more in terms of livestock production. The reality is in the 21st century, we have that plus and Ken did an eloquent job of showcasing all these services that society demands of rangelands and that we need to be cognizant in, in terms of managing for and producing. And in terms of today, we're going to talk about this grassland bird, which is a species of concern in the short grass step and the habitat consideration of this species and how it influences the provision of these other ecosystem goods and services. Understanding that for livestock owners, this is what drives a lot of the enterprise decisions profit. How can we make dollars off that rangeland? So we're going to showcase some trade-offs as we manage for this species and what we give up in terms of profit. So here's really the crux, the overview of our research study. We know from the 19th and 20th centuries, here's where livestock production is. Manage to the center. Manage for that sustainable stocking rate that gives us sustainable livestock production. But at the same time, from a wildlife, especially grassland bird, 
we have habitats that are not represented well on the landscape. Those that are, in, are inclusive of these excessive, very heavy grazing events and some areas that receive very little grazing. So it's no wonder that species such as mount plover, which we're going to discuss, are on the threatened, or potentially on the threatened and endangered species list because we don't have the habitat out there. For livestock reduction, it's usually not one we want to do is try to overgraze excessively. So with that, here's that grassland bird. Again, the mountain plover showcased here in a little nondescript brown bird. Really likes a, a large amount of bare ground, short structure for breeding habitat, nesting and breeding. It comes to short grass prairie in about April to May to nest and breed from the California annual grasslands here in Central Valley. Takes a little trip down to Mexico, back up to short grass prairie breeds, and then moves up to Montana and Canada and makes it winter habit back down here again. So it's complex, and that's a large, that's a bird that has a large geographic region, but influenced by a lot of management in short grass steppe. So what do we know about this bird? Well, very little in terms of its habitat. So one of the first things we did is, where does it nest? Where does it forage? What does it like? So then we can maybe perhaps modify management through livestock grazing to create that habitat. So we went out and found these little nest sites where these birds that had nests and categorized them. We found 106 different sites that either had nest or forage locations. And on general, about 35% bare ground. Well, that's a lot of bare ground in short grass steppe. That's a lot of bare ground in any ecosystem. So there's some negative consequences of ecosystem services there. And vegetation height was about four centimeters, inch and a half. That's short structure, folks. Okay, I don't care if we're in short grass steppe that doesn't get very tall. That's still pretty darn short structure. So this is what we're trying to get to for this species that potentially could be listed and has been, has been petitioned at least twice for threatened and endangered species protection. So we knew from some of the tools that we mentioned in the toolbox that we had some things that we could try to get short structure and high bare ground. One is prairie dogs. They create bare ground by digging holes. They also create short structure by grazing off that grass in and around them for predator control. Prescribed burns creates nice amounts of bare ground in a hurry, takes off the vegetation height, and we can graze at the same time. We can concentrate animals in the early spring because that's when the grassland bird comes to the short grass tip. And we can use supplemental feed to get them in an area and make it a high amount of bare ground without a large spatial extent. And we're going to try some very heavy summer grazing because that's traditionally when these areas are grazed in the short grass steppe is during the summer. So we can graze it off very short in the summer and then still have a habitat for the following spring. So these are kind of the four major treatments we've looked at over the past five years. Here's a summary of results that are just going to come out in an early 2012 in Journal of Wildlife Management. Again, here's that grassland bird. This is the habitat it likes. A lot of bare ground, some forb, short structure. A lot of stuff here on the graph, but I'm going to salient put it down into bare soil. These three dark bars down here are grazing treatments alone. We're not getting about 15 to 20 percent bare ground no matter how we graze the system with livestock alone. The green bar is if we put a burn out there and just burn it, we can get a lot of bare ground. If we have a prairie dog colony out there in the yellow, we get a lot of bare ground. And this again is the sites that the mountain plovers like. Ah, I see a nice grouping here of treatments. Prairie dogs burns right up here, grazing by itself down here. By grazing alone, we can't get the necessary habitat in terms of bare soil. How about for vegetation height? Again, we want short structured vegetation. Our grazing, even with very heavy grazing, which is this bar clear over here, only gets it down to about six and a half centimeters. We just can't graze it low enough with cattle. Now we can do it with horses, but not with cattle. Fire, prairie dogs, clear down here right in line with what those mountain plover like. So we see a little bit of discontinuity here in terms of treatments with grazing and other disturbances. So this is really what happens in terms of cartoons. Again, we like to show these. Grazing alone with cattle, and sorry here for this is not the cattle we use. We don't use Holsteins and short grass step, but depictively we've got them up there. We can graze that system quite hard, and we can get shorter structured vegetation, but it's largely blue grama. Blue grama holds the world together. If you don't know that, please come see us. <laughs> Everything else would fall to pieces if we didn't have blue grama. It's one of those unique species that actually does quite well with grazing. The more you graze it, the better it does. And we have less bare ground. We can't get the bare ground with increasing it just with grazing alone. If we graze and we have a periodic fire, 
we can then have a short-term point where we get rid of excess residue, litter, so forth, and clean it off and create a temporary state of high amounts of bare ground. But the blue ground comes back quite readily well. And so then we've got a chance spatially and temporally to modify vegetation with grazing and fire together. And on the landscape where we already have prairie dogs, take advantage of grazing with prairie dogs. We have short stature vegetation because of prairie dogs. We can create lots of years where we have bare soil because the prairie dogs actually will reduce and diminish the amount of blue grama out there. And so this can be spatially distributed on the landscape because of where the prairie dogs are, which is usually in the lower lying areas, not up on the uplands. And the great thing is mountain plumbers recognize the differences in these habitats. So we have a species in a metric, if you will, that shows us how effectively we can produce ecosystem services on the landscape. So what's that mean in terms of livestock performance? We can do it with the livestock as a grazing tool, as an ecosystem engineer, but what does it do for the pocketbook, essentially? So we captured data from 2006 to 2010. We have 11 data just coming in. And over those years, the blue bar here is moderate stocking. Again, that optimal livestock for production. About a little over a kilogram per head per day, so about 2.3 pounds per head per day. That's what we can get. Irregardless, 2006 was quite dry, 2008 was. Doesn't really matter, we can optimally stock that for good livestock production. We tried some very heavy stocking. We actually doubled the stocking rate in an attempt to try to beat that rangeland up for Mount Plover habitat. What's it do for livestock production in a drought year? Wow, we lost a substantial amount of gain in that year, 2008, the same thing. In decent years, we're still low, so there is, an ac there is a sacrifice in livestock gain. Our patch burns, where we burn part of the pasture, and here we're not burning the entire thing, we're burning about 25%. Again, a little bit of safety valve, we're in a pretty semi-arid environment, high risk. We don't want to burn it all off, let's just burn a portion, and we move that burn location around on the landscape in a spatial and temporal sequence. We're not really seeing any difference here associated with patch burns. That system evolved under heavy grazing and fire, so it's not unexpected that we see this sort of result. We know from some prior work that we did, which is one of the first studies, in fact, probably still might be the only study, looking at how prairie dogs influence livestock game. We've heard all kinds of comments from landowners, and we did this study in response to that because we want to know what was the value of having prairie dogs out there in terms of livestock game responses. As the pasture becomes increasingly colonized by prairie dogs, so this starts out here, very low levels of prairie dogs, and they'll rapidly expand until a plague event happens and wipes them out. If we get to where the pasture is about 60% occupied by prairie dogs, looks like there's a lot of them out there, we're down to about 15% in gain on a per head per animal basis. Not directly proportional, but this is substantial if you're looking at a large amount of investment in livestock production. So let's put this in terms of dollars and cents and pocketbook types, because this is, I think, what we're trying to do and accomplish with these trade-offs in trying to look at managing four ecosystem services and what it costs us in terms of livestock production. So we'll go through this uh, table here, economic consideration of livestock gain, and it's relative to the common management practice. In our case, it's going to be March stocking rates season long on a per yearling steer basis, because that's what a lot of the short grass prairie is grazed with. There's also a pretty good amount of cow calf, but we're using yearlings in this case. If we look at prairie dogs, and this is from that paper I just showed you on that negative response of gain as the number of prairie dogs increase, I picked two levels. Let's say we've got a fifth of the pasture impacted by prairie dogs, our average daily gain is about 5.5% less. Don't think that's too much. Add that up over the season. That's going to cost the producer about $19.70 per steer. Okay, you're running 1,000 steers out there. That's a pretty good hit in your pocketbook. But now if you can produce an ecosystem service, such as maybe Mount Plover Habitat, that gets you off of maybe regulation, perhaps that's a win-win situation, or you get compensated by some other entity that might want to produce mountain plover habitat, here's a dollar figure you can throw at them and say, this is what I might need to overcome and compensate me for my losses. We get to the point where we might be 60% of the pasture influenced by prairie dogs, and we're talking even more impact on livestock gain. About 14% negative reduction. It's costing you as a producer $50 per head per year out there in terms of livestock gain that you didn't realize because you have prairie dogs out on the landscape with you. 
Relative to that, on our prescribed burning, and again, this is patch burning, burning about a quarter of the pasture per year and then rotating that around, we didn't see any sort of negative consequences on livestock performance. <coughs> again, we've done that over five years now, two of which were dry, three of which were wet or average, not seeing any negative consequences. Thus, for the producer, there's really no net economic considerations in terms of livestock performance. And we'll get to the next slide and we'll talk about some of the burning costs. We have this study here where we're coming in early spring and we're really trying to beat the living crud out of a pasture. We have five times the stocking density we should have out there, but we're trying to get it to look like a moonscape in a short time period and then pull those animals off. We want to create mountain plover habitat quickly and then pull them off and let that system rest. Uh, anybody here want to take a 92% reduction in your average daily gain to produce that? Uh, this is 92% reduction also with supplemental feed. We put 10,000 pounds out there for 100 head on a 320 acre pasture. <coughs> there's a lot of cost involved in doing that. That's why there's no dollar cost here because it's a different season of grazing. We've got supplemental feed. This is an amazing amount of input to try to achieve habitat for an ecosystem service. Probably not going to be one that anybody realistically put in that toolbox. Very, very heavy summer grazing. Again, the thought here was we can do this with livestock alone. Well, geez, let's try this. If we actually try to beat that up with livestock grazing, wow, over those five years, again, two of which were dry, three were average to wet, on average, 26% reduction in average daily gain. We're losing $92 per steer here. Now, let's not throw the numbers out there in terms of beef production per unit area because that really goes up. But if we're trying to compare apples to apples to apples here, this is a major cost to the producer. And is it sustainable over the long term? If you continuously try to double stock your rangeland, we know from prior research that we're probably not going to have sustained livestock performance or other ecosystem services over time. So this gives you a little suite, I think, of some of the new data that we're going to start to put out that puts dollar figures to some of these ecosystem services. As Ken mentioned, we have a lot of ecosystem services we're trying to produce, society demands, but there's no markets for a lot of them. And if so, we can start to put numbers out there and say this is what it's going to cost society at large in order for us to sufficiently produce that habitat, that ecosystem services. Otherwise, there's no way we're going to try to modify management to achieve that unless we get some sort of compensation. Here's kind of, I think, the take home of the trade-offs, and, and we're going to focus on this, and, and again, in the field this afternoon, what are these trade-offs, and are there synergies where we can maybe get win-wins? In our system, again, a short grass prairie, we can do prescribed burns fairly well at the end of the season. There's a cost to implementing those. And what that's going to be is going to depend on how large you're going to burn, what sort of equipment you got, if you're a public entity, if you're a private landowner, what might be around you in terms of other land uses, etc. But there's going to be a fairly substantial cost to that. The Forest Service and area recommends for them, it takes about $7 an acre. Now, you could probably do it much cheaper on a private land than you could that. The nice thing for us is that there's no negative effects on livestock gain. So really here, if you're looking at burning, there's just that cost associated with actually putting that practice out there. In terms of prairie dogs, there's really no cost to having them out there other than the fact that they are on your property. What we're finding though is that loss of forage quantity. So they reduce the amount of forage on offer because they're nipping it off, keeping it short for predators, is, off, is greater than the increase in forage quality. So there's really a trade-off there, and prairie dogs reduce livestock gains. Again, about 5% if you've got 20% occupation, and about 15% if you've got 60% in our system. Very high, heavy summer grazing doesn't produce the service. I mean, why do it if we can't produce the ecosystem service? And it has tremendous implications on reduced weight gains. So for us, that's a lose-lose. Very heavy spring grazing, again, doesn't provide the habitat we want in terms of this grassland bird. Talk about reducing livestock gains, plus you've got to put the supplemental feed out there. Here's a triple loss. But again, nice data to have out there to say it's something we've tried as a tool, livestock grazing, very heavy in the spring, just doesn't provide the habitat that's needed for this species. So how do we make this work for land managers? That's really the crux, I think, of why we're here today. Question? Justin, on your uh, prescribed burning, 
contract birth, is there a non-grazed period after the birth where you have a total reduction in livestock capacity? Do you have a non-grazed time period after the contract birth? Great question. Did everybody hear that? Do I need to repeat it? I'll repeat the question. On our prescribed burns, is there a deferment or is there a delay in grazing following the burns to which livestock are not out there, right? Question, and the answer is no. In our case, we're burning in the late fall. The normal time we come on to be mid-spring next year, we come on this just like we would. Now realize that's why we're also doing a patch burn, we're only doing about 25% of the pasture. Even if it's a dry spring, there's some residue forage out there on that other 75% of the pasture where there's forage available until green up comes enough to where there's sufficient forage on the burned areas. And in a couple of those dry years, we've had to wait later in the season for that to green up to provide enough green to substantiate it. But we haven't changed the stock rate. We haven't done anything different. We've kept the management exactly the same in terms of livestock. So great question. How do we make this work? And I think this is kind of where we are looking at in terms of we manage livestock at pasture and at entire enterprise level decisions. We make economic decisions based on what the ranch is doing on the profit loss. A lot of times we're dealing with ecosystem services in our system that are species of concern, be it a plant, animal, whatever else might be, but they're at large scales. Might be an entire ecosystem, might be a watershed, a landscape. So in between, We've got to find these develop and develop these suite of flexible management tools, this adaptive approach. How do we see the larger landscape? How do what I do on my pasture, my ranch, influence what my neighbors are doing? And vice versa, can we spatially optimize those? Can we do things at the larger level to where our operations still work concurrently how we want to do it, but there's a larger diversity at larger scales? How can we do grazing management that maybe moves animals around on in terms of mobility on larger scales rather than just maybe within the constraints of your land ownership and how do we minimize these trade-offs with other ecosystem services there's a lot of work to do here but I think this in the red is where we see this management research and policy starting to overlap and come together within the pasture some things we're trying again we put these supplemental feed tubs out we can attract them we can do patch burning this is easy in terms of research facility. It's tough to do from a livestock producer standpoint. That's a lot of effort because you've got to do something within the pasture, within the fences. It takes time, effort. We can do things among pastures much easier. That's why fences are always great to help us. Within this great big pasture, we can do season-long grazing. We can divide it eight ways, and we can do eight different treatments we want to do. We can divide it, uh, what is this, 32 different ways, and we have 32 different combinations of timing, frequency, rest, duration, whatever. We can really make the landscape different. That's intensification management. That's a lot of input from the livestock manager and whoever else may be the regulatory agency involved with us. Key then, remember, is though we're in the 21st century and so society demands these ecosystem services. We're at this interface of conservation and production. That's the reality where we are. We have this great tool called the grazing animal. We can alter vegetation but we need to understand that there's economic considerations and hopefully I showcase that in a nice table there. Let's use that animal as an engineer. We can do things in terms of composition, cover, diversity, structure. You're going to see some of it in the field this afternoon. Uh, you're going to talk about what we're planning to do here at this research station as well as ours in Wyoming, Colorado to try to make differences on the landscape such that we can produce a suite of ecosystem goods and services. And with that, again, there's my contact information. And if there's time you have a question, I'd be happy to take some.